I was recently reorganizing my bookshelf when I came across The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963 by Christopher Park Curtis. I had read the book as a child and had warm memories of it and similar books. Growing up, there were so many different books and movies that made me fall in love with history as a study and historical fiction as a form of entertainment. I decided to go back through some of these books and reread them now as an adult, especially the books that have been adapted into movies like The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963 with its 2013 film adaption. I plan on reading the book, watching the movie, and then comparing the two to each other and to history. One of my favorite actresses, Anika Noni Rose, is in the film adaption, so that pushed it to the top of the list for me. I'm really glad that I chose this book because the book really is amazing, and although it isn't a word-for-word -word adaption, the film is equally amazing. It also gave me a chance to brush up on my knowledge of the year of Birmingham and how it changed the course of the civil rights movement and history in America. I will be going into detail about specific plot points from both the book and the film, so expect spoilers. Christopher Paul Curtis was born in Flint, Michigan, which is important to remember because many of his stories take place in Flint. Stories like The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963, Bud Not Buddy, and The Mighty Miss Malone. As you read his books, you can feel his love for Flint, for the place, and the people. Right out of high school, Curtis applied for a job at a General Motors assembly facility to help fund his University of Michigan education. His love of reading and writing was always there, but it wasn't until 1995 when he published his debut novel, The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963. The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963 is a coming-of-age tale about a 12-year-old boy named Kenneth set in the 1960s, 1962, and 1963 specifically, told from the point of view of a little black boy in Flint, Michigan. This book does what all of Curtis's books do, which is to humanize black children of the past. This humanization goes beyond Kenneth, the main character, and is extended to his entire family. They are fully fleshed out, and the Watsons, a working-class Black family from Michigan, are brought to life in full color. He has a father, a mother, an older brother named Byron, and a younger sister named Joetta. Because he lives in Flint, Michigan, much of what he knows about racism, he has learned indirectly. As he says in Chapter 9, quote, He'd seen the pictures of a bunch of really mad white people with twisted-up faces screaming and giving dirty finger signs to some little Negro kids who were trying to go to school. End quote. That, however, was only on the news. He also learns about racial inequality and the hostility of the world from his black teachers at Clark Elementary, which, as a side note, is a real school that Christopher Paul Curtis, the author, attended as a child. This book does an amazing job of presenting Kenneth's innocence, and it also does an amazing job of showing both Kenneth and his older brother, Byron, growing out of their various immaturities. They are on opposite ends of the spectrum behavioral-wise, Kenneth is studious, bullied by his fellow classmates, loves to learn and read, so much so that he's taken around Clark Elementary to read in other classrooms as an inspiration for his fellow classmates, proof that there are Black kids who read at miraculous levels. Byron, who the family lovingly calls a juvenile delinquent, has been left back a grade more than once. He loves to skip school, he steals, and he violently bullies others. They couldn't be more different, but both boys get the chance to mature into young men. Even with his behavior, Byron is never otherized by the narrative. Curtis is sure to humanize even the family juvenile delinquent. I really enjoyed seeing both of them grow up. They have a very heartwarming scene at the end of the book and the film that always has me in tears. No matter how many times I read or watch it, I still get misty-eyed. That's the type of humanity that Curtis brings to all of his historical fiction. When asked about the 2014 adaption of her book, The Giver, Lois Lowry said, quote, A book goes out there to a zillion different people, and everyone reads a different book because they bring their imaginations to it. I hope the film will bring the original spirit of the book alive. End quote. Christopher Paul Curtis used this quote to describe his feelings about the 2013 adaption of his award-winning book. I agree with both of them here. Even though the film wasn't a 100% page-by-page adaption of the book, the spirit of the book was carried over from the book to the movie. 
It felt like the same story was being told with the same humor, characterization, tone, and overall message. When you really enjoy reading a book, it's easy to get wrapped up in the excitement of wanting to see every scene from the book translated from page to screen, word for word, bar for bar. But that really isn't always possible for both practical and creative reasons. When discussing the difference between a book and its film, it's important to remember pacing feels different when you're reading it versus watching it. In this case, most of these changes occur because of the differences in time spent in Flint, Michigan versus time spent in Birmingham, Alabama. Because of this, the film also changes some of what happens in Birmingham. We can figure this out when we look at the story structure. There are 15 chapters in total, and we don't get to Birmingham until chapter 9. In the edition of the book that I have, there are 206 pages, and we don't get to Birmingham until page 122. Now, I'm not the best mathematician, so my math could be wrong here, but when I did the math, in the book version of this story, the Watsons don't go to Birmingham until we're 63% of the way into the book. The film is 1 hour and 27 minutes long. The trip begins about 27 minutes into the film, meaning that in the film version of this story, it only takes 31% of the story for the Watsons to get to Birmingham. This difference in story structure is because books have more of a time luxury. The book can include the many character building scenes that it does because books allow for that. Reading those scenes from Kenneth's point of view works, including everything from the book that occurred before the Watsons make their way to Birmingham would have made the film drag a bit, it would have been too front heavy and been badly paced as a result. So here's what was left out of the Flint section of the movie. A storyline featuring Kenneth's first real best friend, Rufus Fry, was erased completely. Before Rufus, Kenneth's only playmate played with him so that he could steal his toy dinosaurs. Because of Kenneth's lazy eye, which becomes glasses in the movie, it's hard for Kenneth to make friends at school. He's either bullied or ignored. Rufus Fry and his younger brother are poor and from the South, which makes them perfect targets for bullies in Flint. This storyline shows Kenneth grappling with peer pressure and loyalty to friends, even when they are the center of ridicule. In chapter three, Kenneth fails his friend Rufus and laughs along with his bullies, but eventually he makes amends with his friend and grows from the situation. Chapter 4 and 6 are also left out of the movie. In chapter 4, Kenneth complains about Winter and his responsibilities as an older brother to Joetta. Byron tells his two younger siblings a scary story about the harsh northern winters freezing people with southern blood solid. And they have southern blood because their mom is from the south. She's from Birmingham. And Kenneth's bully Larry Dunn is humanized. We learn that Larry Dunn steals Kenneth's nice leather gloves because like Rufus, he comes from an impoverished family who can't afford new clothes for winter. It doesn't, of course, excuse his horrible bullying of the boys, but as a reader, you do gain some perspective on why he is the way he is, and you feel some sympathy for him. At least I did anyway, and this is what I'm talking about when I say that Christopher Paul Curtis humanizes all of his characters, even the bullies. Chapter 6 shows Byron's behavior increasingly worsening. And we see some of that in the movie, but not in the same way. Additionally, the slow gradual process of the family getting ready for their road trip was also left out of the film. Those are the major changes of the first Flint portion of the story. The film adaption does a great job of choosing what to leave out and perfectly matching up what was left in to create a seamlessly entertaining story. Honestly, if I hadn't read the book, I wouldn't have known an entire middle section was removed from the original story. To keep the film from feeling slow or repetitive, those scenes that I enjoyed reading had to be removed for the film. After numerous warnings, Byron is caught playing with matches again, and it is also discovered that he has gotten a conch or a hair relaxer. Those actions, in addition to his stealing, skipping school, fighting, and attitude, are the reasons behind the Watson's family trip to Birmingham. The Watsons assure that strict Grandma Sands and the slow-paced Birmingham culture will influence Byron for the better. They outfit the family car with a new drive-around record player, and so begins the family's life-changing trip to Birmingham, Alabama. Like all Black travelers at this time, they have their trip and food planned in great detail, 
to make sure they are able to eat, use the restroom, and travel without facing violence. There is a bit of tension during the ride to Birmingham when Mr. Watson decides to ignore his wife's detailed plans and instead drive the 18-hour, 1,000-mile trip in one go without any of the planned stops. He just wants to get the trip over with, so he just takes it in one go. This tension, however, for the most part, is left out of the adaption. The film's road trip tension comes from an outside force. During the trip, they're in good spirits, having fun, and enjoying each other's company until their good mood is soured by news on the radio announcing the murder of civil rights activist Medgar Evers, which occurred on June 12, 1963. The film includes a short excerpt of Evers' essay, Why I Live in Mississippi. Its inclusion is powerful and sets the tone for what's to come in Birmingham. If you'd like to read that essay, it's linked down below. Grandma Sands welcomes them with hugs and kisses. The greeting is warm and full of love, but their stay will be anything but. This is where book and film events diverge again, which logically makes sense. Because the film spends more time in Birmingham, it will obviously need a storyline to fill that new time. Nearly every conversation with Grandma Sands and her longtime live-in boyfriend, Mr. Roberts, leads to talks about what is going on in Birmingham. These hints at possible danger and mentions of Black people leaving the city don't become real for Kenneth and Byron until they innocently run into a diner expecting service but are turned away. Ignorant to the laws of the land, this is their first lesson on life in the segregated South. They meet their three cousins, James Jr., Sarah, and Naomi, later on that day and get a lesson on the civil rights movement from people who are living it. James Jr., Sarah, and Naomi aren't in the book, but their inclusion and the storyline that comes along with them is superb. With the cousins, the film can realistically cover the various events in the fight for equal rights in Birmingham, Alabama, without it feeling like an information dump. Their retellings of the events are mostly shown in real footage from the 1963 Birmingham campaign and handheld footage with color grading to imitate vintage home videos. The energy of the movement is electric and the shooting style puts the audience right amongst the freedom fighters. This makes it all feel so much more personal. These new characters and their stories are based on the very real lived experiences of the thousands of black children who took a courageous stand during the year of Birmingham. In his January 14th inaugural address, newly elected Alabama Governor George Wallace called for segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. He had no idea that just 238 days later, little Sonny Hereford IV would become the first black child enrolled at a previously all-white public school in Alabama. Part of what enabled this occurred during the year of 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama. During the spring of 1963, the history-changing Birmingham campaign, or Project C, C for Confrontation, was spearheaded by Martin Luther King Jr., the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, local Birmingham pastor Fred Shuttlesworth, and the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, and so many others. Honestly, I just want to say it's really impossible to list everyone who was involved in this and who participated in this history changing event. So just keep that in mind. There are big names, of course, but there are also little people who participated and contributed to this in various ways. Their objective was to weaken the system of racial segregation in Birmingham. The Birmingham campaign would use nonviolent daily mass demonstrations like kneelings in segregated churches, sit-ins in diners, mass protests, economic boycotts of downtown merchants, and marches to protest segregation in the city that was considered by many to be the most racially segregated city in the South. The campaign began on April 3rd, 1963. Its biggest challenge was Eugene Connor, Birmingham's Commissioner of Public Safety, who was a hostile segregationist. Hundreds of nonviolent protesters were arrested. This was the goal of the campaign because mass arrest of nonviolent protesters would overwhelm the penal and justice system, while showing the general public the lengths Black Americans were willing to go through to exercise their constitutional rights as American citizens. Because they had planned for these arrests, 
bail money had been set aside to bail out the protesters. However, things changed on April 10th when Birmingham received a state circuit court injunction meant to put a stop to the protest. Some within the campaign thought the court order should be obeyed. However, after much debate, it was decided that they could not in good conscience obey an injunction which was misusing the law for unjust reasons. To add to their troubles, they were quickly running out of bail money and would not be able to guarantee the release of arrested protesters going forward. Martin Luther King Jr. decided now was the time for him to submit to an arrest with or without enough bail money. It had to be done to preserve the credibility of the campaign. He disobeyed the injunction by parading without a permit and was arrested on April 12th and placed in solitary confinement. Four days later, he would complete the letter from Birmingham jail, one of his most widely known works and one of the most influential letters written by a political prisoner in modern times. This open letter discussed the responsibility we have to break unjust laws with direct action. It is also in this letter that he wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The letter was a response to another open letter called A Call for Unity, which was written by eight white Birmingham clergymen. They felt the methods used by the protesters were incorrect and that they should instead negotiate and use the courts if they felt their rights were being denied. Incidentally, when you research these clergymen, none of them would be considered segregationists. Many even actively worked for integration. They are in part who King was referencing when he spoke of the disappointing, quote, white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, or who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season." End quote. King was released on April 20th, eight days after his arrest. After months of protest and the arrest of major leaders of the movement, the campaign remained at a standstill. Leaders within the SCLC decided it was time for a new tactic. This tactic included children and was called the Children's Crusade. The Children's Crusade met opposition, but ultimately began on May 2nd, 1963. Thousands of children ages 6 to 18 engaged in nonviolent marches and were arrested, overwhelming the jail, which only had a 900 capacity. The turning point of this campaign came on May 3rd during the D-Day Youth March, when Commissioner Connor ordered local police and fire departments to forcefully end the demonstrations. Images of children being violently attacked by police dogs, hit with high pressure fire hoses, and viciously clubbed by police officers appeared all over newspapers and televisions. There was national and international outrage, which caused two things to happen. First, local white businesses began to suffer because of the effective boycotts and the negative image many had of Birmingham. Attorney General Robert Kennedy sent his chief civil rights assistant, Burke Marshall, to help with negotiations between prominent Black Birmingham citizens and representatives from Birmingham's Senior Citizens Council, the city's business leadership. On May 10th, the two parties reached an agreement. The demonstrations would halt. Restrooms, lunch counters, drinking fountains, and department store fitting rooms would be desegregated and all protesters would be released from jail on bond. A program to improve Black employment was also a part of the negotiations. Second, the previously moderate president took direct action. On June 11th, President Kennedy took a stand on the side of the movement with his historic civil rights address, which promised a bill that would give Black people, quote, the kind of equality of treatment which we would want for ourselves, end quote. The promised bill would be the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which went on to be pushed for and signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson after Kennedy's assassination. It was the brave sacrifice of those young people who participated in the Children's Crusade during the Birmingham Campaign of 1963 that led to this change. The Watson children are impressed after hearing the role that their cousins and thousands of children like them played in making change, most especially Byron, who resolves to march with his cousins the next time they get a chance. 
After watching To Kill a Mockingbird in a segregated movie theater, Kenneth overhears a discussion between Byron and their father, who is heading back to Flint for work. Throughout their time in Alabama, we have seen Byron maturing, and this conversation highlights it. Their father wants Byron to be the man of the family while he isn't there. He is sure Byron can do it. At the beginning of the film, the audience wouldn't agree, but now we do. After getting a taste of the wider world, both Kenneth and Byron begin to change in different ways. Byron begins to avoid unnecessary danger and obey the warnings of his grandmother and other adults. Conversely, the usually cautious Kenneth incorrectly decides that he is old enough to disobey the adults and face Cooler's Landing, the local body of water which has already claimed multiple lives. When Kenneth gets caught in the whirlpool and begins to drown, Byron gives his all to pull his little brother out of the water into shore, showing that his nonchalant attitude toward his family is just a false, tough guy facade that Byron thought made him a man back in Flint. His time in Birmingham has shown him otherwise, and it's very clear that he loves his brother and the rest of his family. Byron isn't the only one in the family who has changed. Older people like Grandma Sands and Mr. Robert are hopeful now and proud of all the people ready and willing to face violence for change. Mama, who missed Birmingham while she was in Flint, is not as hopeful. Her time in Alabama has only reminded her why she left and what she didn't want for her children. As the family watches the March on Washington on television, Kenneth wonders if he could ever be as strong as his family around him and those on TV. He would love to be like them, but all he feels is fear, which makes him feel ashamed. I'm quite sure there are many people like him in the past who knew what was right, but still felt afraid to fight for it. It's very interesting to see a main character with this characterization instead of the usual extremely brave, have no fear type protagonist. Their time in Birmingham comes to a head on September 15, 1963. Little Joetta has found friends in Birmingham and is now a member of the 16th Street Baptist Church Choir. Excited for her choir performance, she wears a pretty white dress and new heels, a gift from Grandma Sands. Dad has just rejoined his family in Birmingham and everything is going well. Then the unthinkable happens. Someone has bombed the church that little Joetta is in. On Sunday, September 15th, 1963, the 16th Street Baptist Church was abuzz with excited energy as a group of young girls got ready to sing in their church choir. Addie Mae was tying the dress sash of her younger sister, Sarah, while their older sister read her Bible nearby. At 10.22 a.m., the church received an anonymous call. When 14-year-old Carolyn Mall, the church's Sunday school secretary, answered the phone call, all she heard was someone say three minutes. Little Carolyn had no way of knowing this brief call was a twisted warning. Hours earlier, four KKK members had placed more than a dozen sticks of dynamite under the stairs of the church. Less than one minute after the call, the bomb went off. The explosion was so strong that it blew a passing driver out of his car and caused damage to buildings more than two blocks away. Many people rushed to the church to assist in the search for bodies amongst the rubble. Four little girls, 14-year-old Addie Mae Collins, 11-year-old Denise McNair, 14-year-old Carol Robertson, and 14-year-old Cynthia Wesley were taken to Hillman Emergency Clinic, but were pronounced dead on arrival. Numerous others were injured, including a fifth girl, Addie Mae's 12-year-old sister, Sarah, who was left blind in one eye as a result of glass being embedded into her face during the explosion. Like the Children's Crusade months before, this terrorist attack also got national and international attention. Even with all of this attention, no one would be held accountable for this heinous crime for decades. A semblance of justice came in 1971, when Alabama got a new Attorney General. Attorney General Bill Baxley began looking through evidence which led to the arrest and conviction of ringleader Robert Chambliss in 1977. Chambliss served his sentence until he died in 1985. The FBI reopened the case in the mid-1990s, which resulted in life sentences for both Thomas Blenton and Bobby Cherry. Cherry served until his death in 2004, and Blenton served until his death in 2020. The fourth known participant in the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing 
Herman Cash had died years earlier in 1994. He never paid for his involvement. While the bomb at the 16th Street Baptist Church is the most widely known, mostly due to those four sweet little girls, these sorts of bombings and attacks were not new to Birmingham. Between 1947 and 1965, there were about 50 dynamite explosions and the majority went unsolved. These anti-integration terrorist attacks were so common that many called Birmingham, Bombingham. When black families began moving into the white west side of Center Street, the community earned the name Dynamite Hill from the frequent bombs and retaliation. Attacks on black American places of worship are a mainstay of American terrorism. One of the earliest documented attacks occurred after Denmark Vesey's rebellion in 1822. The church he founded and attended, Emanuel AME Church, was burned to the ground and had its two ministers, Morris Brown and Charles Drayton, banished to Philadelphia as a response to the 1822 slave rebellion. The congregation met in secret until they could safely rebuild their church after the Civil War. While this event happened in Charleston and the 16th Street bombing happened in Birmingham, Alabama, attacks like this were not restricted to the South. During the 1842 Lombard Street riot in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the second African-American Presbyterian church was burned down by Irish Catholic immigrants who felt some of the more financially successful black residents, like Robert Purvis, were flaunting their success. The mob made their way to Robert Purvis' family home with an aim to loot and burn it. They, however, left the home after a Catholic priest intervened to stop them. The 16th Street Baptist Church bombing is one in a long line of similar attacks, and we see that, unfortunately, these attacks have continued on into the 21st century. Including this event in both the book and film was necessary. Honestly, when I first watched the film, I was very worried that they were going to censor this scene. I thought they would skip over the bombing to make the film easier to digest. You know, more quote-unquote family-friendly. But I'm very glad that they didn't, not because I like to see these kind of scenes, but because making sure these events are not erased from books and films is just one way to remember and honor the victims and survivors of these heinous acts. The family finds out that little Joetta left the church moments before the attack to get away from the heat and to look for Kenneth, who she thought she saw outside. In the book, they leave Birmingham that night and never tell Joetta what happened. She is allowed to keep her innocence in that way. Movie Joetta, however, hears the bombs go off and is just as worried as everyone else. The Watsons leave Birmingham as quickly as they possibly can. Although they try to convince Grandma Sands and Mr. Roberts to come to Flint with them, they both refuse to leave Birmingham. Birmingham is their home, and staying despite the hate and violence, is an issue of principle for them. When the family arrives back in Flint, Kenneth is experiencing what we now would call PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Additionally, he feels guilty and ashamed because he believes that he failed himself and his family when he ran away from the bomb site instead of helping to search for his younger sister. All of his insecurities were confirmed by his perfectly natural reaction to his fear and shock. He goes through an intense grieving period where he barely eats and he sleeps behind the family sofa, thinking it possesses magic strong enough to heal how broken he feels inside. It takes a while, but Kenneth's grieving period eventually ends in a heartwarming, heart-to-heart -heart session with Byron, where he finally lets all of his pent-up shock, fear, pain, and anger out in tears. Byron, no longer the immature young man he once was, steps up to the plate, offering his brother a shoulder to cry on, a listening ear, and thoughtful, encouraging words. Kenneth has reached the final stage of grief, acceptance. The two brothers' introduction to the wider world and its hostility was sudden, harsh, and painful, but they will survive with love from family and friends. The book version of the story ends here. The movie has two more scenes, one where we see Kenneth stand up to his longtime bully, Larry Dunn, Byron comes to fight Larry for him, but Kenneth doesn't need him to anymore. Kenneth's newfound confidence shocks Larry, and he quickly leaves, leaving the audience to believe Kenneth will no longer be bullied. The last scene shows the Watsons watching 
As the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 gets passed, this is a great way to end the movie. Visually, the first time you see all of the Watsons together, they are in the living room, freezing cold and upset. Byron is separated from them, sitting in a chair off to the side. The last time you see them at the end of the film is drastically different. It's warm, they're wearing bright colors, smiling and laughing together, and Byron is on the sofa with them, no longer misunderstood or off to himself. They've made it through the lows of life together. They went through a lot, but with love, they made it through on the other side, changed for the better. Christopher Paul Curtis is an amazing author. He can transport readers to a different time and place, all while making you deeply feel what his characters are feeling. I can't recommend The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963 enough. Both the book and its film adaption are great. The film included important scenes from the book, kept the personalities of the book characters intact, and even added more historical context to the Watson's trip to Birmingham, Alabama. I really enjoyed seeing the humanization and the growth of a little black boy from the 1960s. I watched it on Tubi. I'm not sure how long it will be up there. So watch it while you can. I think it might also be on Amazon Prime. But honestly, if you can't find it for free, I think it's worth the price of admittance, especially if you like this time period and you want to learn more. It was very moving. I really enjoyed it. I plan on doing more videos like this, so if you liked it, please like the video and leave a comment down below, especially if you know anyone who participated in the Birmingham campaign of 1963, if you participated in the campaign, if you were alive at the time, what was it like seeing it on TV, anything like that. Leave those experiences down below. I really want to preserve that history. Again, thank you so much for watching. Bye. Hello, this is Credits Erica. Thanks for watching. Here's a hint for what I'm going to be doing next. It's another Nika Nani Rose film. I didn't realize it when I was writing it, but I realize it now. <laughs> um, it's a musical. It's not the big musical. It's not the first musical that came to your mind. It's the other musical, the more recent musical. If you have an idea of what I'm going to be doing next, put it in the comments. Thanks for watching. See you then.